on um, our third individual, um, Irenaeus. Irenaeus of Lyons, and again, that's not a selfie, that's a, a drawing, probably of many years past that time, of what he possibly could look like, um, except this guy only has four fingers. I don't know if you'll notice that. Um, and uh, But nothing really about four fingers. I mean, it's just the way the, the drawing is. He's got a halo, so he must be a super saint. Um, but honestly, as you're going to see, just as with the other individuals, um, <clears throat> these men lived in the time in which they were born, and God used them in a, in a certain way, and so they're just like us in that sense. Um, the culture is different, the time is different, language is different, uh, but it's, they still had to serve the Lord in this world. And so uh, Ignatius, Irenaeus, Ignatius we looked at in week one. Uh, some people get them confused because the names sound similar, but, um, but these are pretty famous individuals and the, and to us because <clears throat> at the time period in which they lived, uh, they did some notable things. Uh, they, they, they wrote documents and letters. Uh, they spoke out against heresies, uh, various things. And so uh, these are why, that's why we're studying these uh, individuals. So just to kind of go back to our map, um, this area up here, that's the area of France, right? But back then it wasn't called that. It was called the area of Gaul, G-A-U-L. Um, you'll see a little town here. Um, it's right in this area. And uh, don't worry about, oh, I keep forgetting to bring the map so you can take the quiz. Um, but this area is the area of Lyons, L-Y-O-N-S. Um, that'll become important. But um, this is where Irenaeus will pastor and minister, okay? But he starts over here in the land of Asia Minor, in a town, in a city that's in Scripture, uh, Smyrna. You ever heard of Smyrna? It's in the book of Revelation. And so um, that's where it, it all starts for him. So Irenaeus, we do have a record of around maybe 130 A.D. when he was born. He was born into a Greek family, so he's Gentile in the land or in the city area of Smyrna uh, in Asia Minor, okay? That's the home. Now, the thing about, a, about Smyrna, that is the hometown of Polycarp. And uh, Polycarp was one who knew the Apostle John. So Irenaeus, you could say he was raised in a Christian home. So he came under the influence of Christianity in his early years, growing up. Polycarp, who was the friend of Ignatius, remember Ignatius we looked at in week one a couple weeks ago? So Polycarp presided over the church located in Smyrna. So here is Irenaeus, a younger boy in a, living in a Christian home, who attends the church in Smyrna, and the pastor of the church is Polycarp, and Polycarp knew personally John the Apostle. Isn't that interesting? And so you see a connection there. Irenaeus remembered that the Lord used Polycarp during the early years of his life to draw him to faith in Jesus. So... Poly, uh, Irenaeus would reflect upon that and say, you know, Polycarp coming to Christ, knowing the Apostle John, um, uh, pastoring the church, being under his ministry, he was able to, you know, understand about the Lord, grow in his faith. And so Irenaeus reflects on that, remembers that. Polycarp had been a disciple of the Apostle John, and this knowledge of, of Polycarp learning from the Apostle John who was with Jesus led the young Irenaeus to believe that God gave him the privilege 
of being connected directly back to the time when the apostles lived. He felt a connection to all of that, and, and that, that just helped resonate the truth in his heart. The truth is the truth. It doesn't matter um, when you hear it, at what period of time, um, but Irenaeus really appreciated the connection and how God was, you know, had led him and placed him in that environment. And he was exposed to, to biblical truths at a very early age. He says it this way, I'm able to describe the very place in which the blessed Polycarp sat as he discoursed, and his goings out and his comings in, and the manner of his life, and his physical appearance, and his discourses to the people, and the accounts which he gave of his time spent with John and others who had seen the Lord. And as he remembered their words and what he had heard from them concerning the Lord and his miracles and teachings, and teaching, having received it from eyewitnesses of the quote unquote word of life. The phrase word of life would come, um, he didn't get that from the school that's called word of life, but um, he got that from, you know, Peter saying, you have the words of eternal life. And so that's, that was like a, just a statement for the scriptures that, that Jesus spoke. And uh, it just had an impact on his life. So here's a, a, a real guy, you know, who um, came into this world, needed to know the Lord, was a sinner, needed to repent from sin and come to Christ in faith, the whole thing. And he came in that environment of being in a local church, which was very interesting. And this is cited from Eusebius, which is a church historian. So again, he's, he's, um, he was an early church historian, and that's how we learn we learn a lot from these men because of that, um, that church history being, uh, being there, uh, and we also get it from their own writings. So let's think about the early adult years of Irenaeus as he grew up. He would eventually immigrate to a place called Gaul, which is present-day France which was far from his home in Asia Minor. We do not have a record of his conversion experience. Okay, It's different than Justin Martyr. Um, and the reason we have Justin Martyrs from last week when we talked about it is because Justin Martyr gave it, a, he, he expressed it in one of his writings. He gave a personal testimony of what happened. We don't have that for Irenaeus. So by the time he is early adult years, he's, he's already a believer. At this point. And so he, he's in Smyrna in Asia Minor. And of all the craziest places to go, what would lead him to go there? You know, you would think, okay, this is the guy who most likely needs to stay in the church. And he's going to be the associate pastor to Polycarp. And when Polycarp is gone, this guy's taken over. I mean, that would be the expectation. That's at least how we would think of it. But God led him uh, to go to Gaul present-day France, on the other side of the Roman Empire. You say, why would he do such a thing? Well, there's even a possibility that he stayed in Rome for a period of time before actually going to live in Gaul. So he leaves Smyrna, goes to Rome, then to Gaul. And I think there's two possibilities of what could have created that. Number one, if you trace the history of the Gauls, that people group, okay, they start in that area of, of France. That's their area. That's where, they, that's where they reside, 5th and 6th century B.C. And if you trace their history, they eventually go into northern Italy, that area, and they, this is before you know, the Roman Empire became the Roman Empire, and they fought with the Roman Empire, eventually lost. And, but their people kept migrating the other direction. They kept going from the west to the east. Eventually, they would become people, the people group, that would reside in the area of Galatia. They would become the Galatians. 
which was in the same region where Smyrna was. So it could be that Irenaeus, even though he was not a descendant of them, felt compelled for whatever reason to go there. And I think it's in connection with his calling that God had given him. He, he has a missionary calling. He's going to a place that he's never been, to an area where he's never been, to a people that don't speak exactly like him, that has a different culture to it. So he's like he's a missionary. But what's interesting is he, how, uh, if, if he went to Rome, which we have some good possibility that he did, and he stayed there for a period of time, then went to Gaul, the second reason would be the way he traveled there, he's following a pattern. He's following the pattern of the Apostle Paul who desired to go to Spain and was going to reside in Rome for a period of time before going there. And in a sense, all roads lead in and out of Rome. And I'm not talking about just geography. It's kind of the hub, right? He could have gone a path to get to Gaul without going into Rome. But when you're going to travel that far, and the way you had to do it in those days, Rome was just the place to go. And so there was a church there. There's people there. And another possibility is that he had some interaction with Justin Martin. That's why I had to save him for week three and talk about Justin Martyr last week. So Justin Martyr, remember, he made his way over to Rome. And so by the time they, they lived during the same period of time, there is a possibility. Doesn't We don't have direct evidence. But there is a likelihood that they had some kind of level of interaction. But eventually, Irenaeus would land in the area of Gaul, in the city of Lyons specifically. He did state in his writings that he held Justin Martyr in high regard. He did use him as a source of information about current versions of the heresies that existed during that time. And that's why that possibility exists that maybe they even met each other at one point in time. What is sure is that he did eventually arrive in Gaul and he described himself as a resident among the Celts. The Celts was the original name of that people group that eventually migrated to Asia Minor and to the region of Galatia and became what we know as the Galatians. And so he says, I'm a resident among them. So stating it that way, it looks as though he's not, I'm not a descendant of the Celts, but I'm, I'm there living among them. So it's, that's why I, I lean more to the missionary idea that he goes to an area unknown to himself. He's never been there before. Irenaeus was painfully aware of the different culture in that part of the world. He apologized at one point for his crude writing style because he had become accustomed to using a barbarous dialect. The land of the barbarians. You want to know why they called them barbarians? Do you know why they call them barbarians? Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. It sounded to them like a foreign language, <laughs> you know, bar 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 bar. It's like they're the barbarians, and um, and so it was. Uh, that's that was how the term originated, um, at least in the way we can understand it. So he was in a different land, a different culture, a different place, and um, and I understand that because I lived in the Philippines for seven years. So when you come back from living in a foreign country, you don't think exactly the same. And and I would like in in the Philippines, you drive much differently than you do here. Um, in the Philippines, you are bumper to bumper with everybody. That's just the way the traffic is. And so I'm reminded by my wife quite often, you can't drive like that here. You know, it doesn't work that way here in America. I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Um, 
<laughs> She'll look at me and say, you drive like a Filipino. And I was like, yeah, pasenchana, uh, you know, that means sorry. Um, and uh, so um, that's kind of how it works. Now, the Christians in Gaul experienced persecution. A lot of it was because, I mean, they, it's because of their faith in Christ, but it, it was due to this emperor worship where the emperor is God. And as you go through the second century, it gets worse and worse and worse. The heresies get worse and the persecution can get worse. And it ebbs and flows every once in a while, but it's, it has a trajectory. And if you're, if you're not going to bow to the, to the emperor... If you're, gonna, if you're not going to acknowledge the emperor is God, I mean, you're just asking for trouble. I mean, just imagine whoever is the president of our country at any given time decided, and let's just imagine America was not a democracy but a dictatorship, and, and the dictator decided that he's God or she's God And that if you, if you don't bow down to, to that ruler, you're going to acknowledge that there's another God over the, over the dictator of the country? How dare you? And this is the dilemma that faced every believer. And they were persecuted in other ways. Um, because of their, because of communion, right? Um, participating in communion, they would be um, labeled as cannibals. They partake of the body and the blood of somebody who died. Oh, how gross. So they were misunderstood. They were slandered um, in great ways because of their faith in Christ. And the pastor of the church at the time in the, in the city of Lyons, uh, Pothenius, I'm um, hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, he died on account of that persecution. And so when the persecution subsided, it had a little bit of a lull to it. Uh, it would come back. Like I said, it, it, it kind of got worse as it went along overall, but it would ebb and flow. Um, there was a period when it was peaceful. Uh, they weren't being attacked. Irenaeus became the pastor of that church. So he, he's there for a period of time. We don't have a date. I don't have a date for when he becomes the pastor uh, of the, and the shepherd of the church, but um, he became a pastor there. He kept close connections with the church that existed in the city of Rome. This is another reason why we think he went to Rome before coming to Gaul. And I'm not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. That did not really start, that was not really formal until the 400s, okay? We're, this is still second century. And, and so just the church that existed there, he had connections with them. And on one occasion, the church in Lyons sent a delegation to the church in Rome, to the Roman church, with a letter describing the extent of the persecution that they faced in the city of Lyons, what it, what it looked like, what it was about, how, how it existed, all that. The one who was appointed as the messenger of the letter, the one who would deliver it, was Irenaeus. They sent him. And again, most likely he had connections in Rome. He knew those people to some degree. And the, and the opening of the letter said something like, We have requested our brother and comrade Irenaeus to carry this letter to you, and we ask you to hold him in esteem as, as he is zealous for the covenant of Christ. <coughs> and what that means by covenant is just the work of Christ. It's a, just a general term in that sense. Here is our brother, uh, our pastor, here is one that we're sending to you. We want him, uh, just recognize him, receive him. And this letter describes what the persecution was like. The letter also says that Irenaeus is foremost among them. So he's, that's 
he's high up in the in the church leadership. So we can see kind of how the Lord was using him to lead the church there in Lyons. He would preach, he pastored, he shepherded, he ministered. Uh, that, that was his main area of focus. So he also wrote documents. Again, writing was something that, that was very common in that period of time, just as writing is today. But writing theologically... Um, these men knew that their writings were not on the same level of Scripture. Okay, they never asserted that, but you have to understand the dynamic of, of the culture at the time. You have these Christians who would live in these places, and they, they imagine it this way. When you're out there in the world living your life, it's a totally different deal the majority of the people in the city don't believe in Jesus. They're not Christians. They're not bowing to the Savior. They may not even have heard of Him. Or they are, are, are there are people who are antagonistic towards the Christians. And so you're living your life day by day, raising your kids, raising your family, um, going to your workplace, you know, same as we would do today. But you had this kind of cloud of persecution that could take place because you're not in the majority. There's no such thing as freedom of speech. There's no such thing as you have your rights. Okay? Not when it comes to <laughs> Christianity. You could be looked on as a troublemaker, as a rebel rouser, as a rioter, as, as someone who is just loony. You could be viewed as somebody who is a crazy person. And while you're living your life day by day by day by day, you don't have a Bible with from, from Genesis to Revelation that you can read at any given point. It does not exist in your home. And so the only way, the way that you learned the Bible, the way you learned God's Word, the way you were exposed to it, was you had to come to the church. And it's not that that church would even have all of the scriptures either. And so the pastors of the churches would write treatises. They would write letters just like the apostles did even though it wasn't at the same level of being scripturalized. I mean, it's not scripture. But it became important to communicate the truths of scripture in a way that the people could have it. So you have to understand the dynamic. And so since you did not have um, a Bible in front of you, one of the things that would happen is that people would learn creeds. You've heard of creeds, right? Creeds, all creeds are. And we kind of elevate them sometime to a status that maybe we, we look at them differently than we should. But what creeds were, were... Um, Ways in which truths could be distilled down into simplified form so that they could be understood and memorized. I think I showed you 1 Timothy 3.16. There's a creed that Paul mentions. It's like little statements of truths. And they're written like in a... It has the form of Hebrew poetry. And they're designed in such a way to distill down deep truths rich theological truths into short little statements that everybody could remember. And so it was important to have things written down. It was, um, he wrote a book called The Proof of Apostolic Preaching. It was a short book. He comments on the basic creed he knew during his lifetime, similar to one that would be like in 1 Timothy 3.16. He defends apostolic doctrine through scriptural exegesis. All he's trying to do is say this is what God revealed to the apostles in the New Testament and this is what it means, and this is what it means by what it says. I mean, he's just trying to explain scripture. The way people live their life, Christians, the way you live your life 
in this world is by understanding Scripture and being exposed to Scripture. And think about it. They did not have access to it very easily. How much access do we have? We have it on our phones. We can have it read to us. We have different versions of it. <clears throat> we are blessed. He wrote another book. Well, this was actually a treatise. This is what he's famous for. And when people talk about Irenaeus, it's, it's this that I'm about to talk about. Against Heresies. It's a multi-volume book. This would give you a little bit of um, insight into it. I know you can't see this side of the screen. It's real small. But it is. there's book one, two, three, four, and five. And this is book one. And look how extensive it is. This guy wrote, a, it's like a multi-volume set. And this guy was a deep thinker. I mean, I've, I've read some of this, and I'm scratching my head trying to figure it out. I know what he's talking about, but the way he's talking about it is very, very deep. I'm going to try to explain it to you in layman's terms, what he's dealing with. He was a, he he he. Uh, this is when you when you have the title against a g a i n s t. That's kind of the idea of an apology, giving a defense of biblical Christianity, and opposing the heresy that attacks that goes contrary to biblical Christianity. So, just so you, I want to make sure you understand this too. You're living your life in the second century. You're a believer in Christ. You're a Christian. You got your family. You got your job. You're going out and doing your job, um, your work every week or every day, and you're uh, you're attending the church and you're growing in your faith. At the same time, you're dealing with the the possible of possibility of persecution from the world, from the outside world. That's from the that which happens from the outside of the church, but from within the church, you're dealing with possible false doctrine. And so all that's happening in your life at the same time. So Irenaeus would, would, he had to deal with outside persecution, like traveling to Rome, delivering that letter, but he also had to deal with heresies that would, would try to encroach upon the church to destroy it from within. Satan wants to destroy every Bible-believing church. How does he do it? Two ways. From the outside, trying through persecution. The other way is from the inside through corruption. That's how it works. That Satan's strategy still happens today. And Irenaeus is addressing a major heresy that is seeking to make inroads into the life of the church, and he wants to address it. And it's a bad one. This is a bad one that he's trying to address. It's a five-volume treatise. The full title of it is The Detection and Overthrow of What is Falsely Called Knowledge. Remember the Gnostics that I talked about a couple of weeks ago? Gnosticism. This is another version of that. But it's, it's worse than the other one. And he writes five volumes. All of that material I was just kind of scanning through just showing you, it's all about this one big heresy. And when you, if you don't know what he's writing about and you start reading his work, you're like, what in the world is he talking about? It's because that, that heresy, in exactly as it art was articulated, does not exist today. It's, we have other ones. that when, you, when I explain what this one is, you'll be able to equate it pretty regularly with other heresies that happen today. But this was the formulation of it. And he spends all of his pages describing the, the, the details of, of that heresy. Most people would say to themselves, okay, it's not biblical, forget about it. You know, not even going to deal with it. 
Why would he spend so much time and so much paper and ink writing about this whole thing, describing it in all of its detail? Because not, it's not just he just wanted to do it. Or run it you know, he's not just writing a paper on it. It's because it was dangerous. And, he, if he, and if he could describe it in its detail, then people would be aware of it. That's why he spends so much time writing this book, or this five-volume treatise. His attempt was to expose the dangerous teachings of a group of false teachers called the Gnostics, but a certain version of the Gnostics is what he's actually going to deal with here. He viewed these heretics as a deadly threat to the church. If you buy into that heresy, if you believe that heresy, then you have totally missed the whole point of the whole Bible. And that's why he knew he needed to write about it. He's trying to warn people. And as far as I know, nobody was telling him, hey, Irenaeus, come on, cool the jets here. Can't be that bad. Nothing's that bad. <laughs> oh, if you knew what I knew, he would say, this thing is dangerous. And you need to be aware of it. And I'll be honest with you, this exact heresy doesn't exist in this exact form, but there are patterns of it that do exist today. And it's dangerous. And it's subtle at the same time. So what is it? This is what I want to spend the rest of our time looking at. Got about 20 minutes to break this down to you. And um, okay, when you think of Gnosticism, I gave you a little bit of an introduction to that two weeks ago. Here comes the more details. Gnosticism was an ideology. It was a belief system. There's no, you can't go to Walmart and buy Gnosticism. It's not a product. Okay, it's not a physical object. And it was not connected to a physical image like an idol. Okay? You can't go to a certain place and bow down to the Gnostic idol. Okay? It was all in their head. It was a belief system. It was an ideology. And it spread to various places throughout the empire. It started outside the church, but gathered steam and tried to make inroads into the church. And it did not have one, you couldn't, you couldn't write a doctrinal, it, they didn't have doctrinal statements back then. Not for Gnostics. They really didn't, they didn't codify their thing, the, what they believed. It was, um, they didn't write out, you know, they, they wrote certain books. They have what we call Gnostic Gospels. But you, you would you'd be, you'd be hard pressed to, to find a, here's what we believe and here's, here's a statement of faith. No. They just kind of propagated their own views. So it started in the first century. And it morphed and changed over the years. By the time you get to the 200s, the time of Irenaeus, it's really in a full-orbed form. Where it's more discernible and more dangerous. But it starts in the first century. Paul, when he writes the epistle to Colossians, is dealing with some version of that. It was connected to Judaism, but it was like a Judaistic, Gnostic heresy cult, or not, uh, at least Gnostic heresy belief. John's first epistle, the, first, the five chapters in 1 John, he's really kind of dealing with something that way as well. 2 Peter chapter 2 and the book of Jude. You know, that's the teaching where they're talking about false teachers, false teachers, false teachers. Peter and Jude never give names to them. But the way that's written, it would fit those Gnostics pretty much. Remember Ignatius? He opposed a, a Gnostic belief called docetism. And I won't go back through all that. That was in the first uh, week. So it had different forms to it. As the years advanced, it became more formalized. Even though... They still didn't write down, here's, here's what we are, come join us. It was more, it just, 
it took more form. If you were trying to analyze, and this is what Ignat uh, Irenaeus does, he analyzes the movement. He analyzes Gnosticism. He tries to figure out what's really happening, and that's what he spends his time articulating. So he can label it, identify it, because they didn't do that themselves. <laughs> it would be described as the multi hued conglomerate of Gnostic beliefs. I mean, not every Gnostic group held to the same beliefs from here to here to here. So it's, it can be regional based, geographically based. That's why you can have docetism in one group or one area, one geographic, geographical area, and you could have a different form of it in another area. So not all of it was the same, but it was all dangerous. So the particular kind of Gnosticism that Ir uh, Irenaeus was dealing with is what we call the Valentinian Gnostics. That'll be on the quiz next week. There's always a quiz. Um, and when you think of the Valentinian Gnostics, it reads like mythology. It, it's, it, most likely, my take on it is it, it came out of the Roman and Greek gods and goddesses, that whole system, but it, it's not exactly like that, okay? But it reads like mythology. But I'm going to give you the layman's version of this. There's a lot more detail to it that Irenaeus in his writings um, describes in his treatise. Think of it this way. This, I want you to wipe out, <laughs> wipe out your mind. Okay, Forget any biblical knowledge you've ever learned for the time being. Don't think biblical. Okay? It starts with nothing. And the first thing that shows up is there's this thing called the heavenly fullness. They have other terms for it, but it's like a heavenly fullness. That's the, that is the beginner of everything. The heavenly fullness. The heavenly fullness, there's not even an earth yet. There's no creation yet, okay? It starts with the heavenly fullness. He's just there. He produces 30 angelic beings, angelic type beings, and they're called eons. Eons. The eons come in male and female pairs. Irenaeus' term is masculine, feminine. Masculo, femino, something like that. Or femina. And, and they're, they're in, that means they cohabitate with each other and can produce other eons. So the fullness he produced through an, a, a process 30 angelic beings. He did not make them himself. He created like three to four and then they produced the rest. And you want to know why it's 30? Because they would say, this is what Irenaeus tells us, if you go to the parable, of, remember the parable where Jesus says there is um, laborers in the field and some went out at noontime or early you know, in the day, later in the day, 3 o'clock, you know, different times of the day. If you add those numbers, it comes to 30. That's the magic number. 30. At least that's how Irenaeus figured they added it up. It could have been another way. But anyway, they have 30 eons. So think about it. The fullness, whoever that is, is, with, is made these eons, these heavenly beings, and they procreate to make other heavenly beings. These conjugal pairs, they am, now when they create an eon, it's lower in status, so there's a hierarchy. So the ones that the fullness made are at a certain higher level, and then, you know, you can't be... Uh, two of the higher ones can't... When they, when they make an eon themselves, 
It's lower in status. And so you have these, what they call emissions, these propagation of other eons. And it keeps going lower and lower throughout the 30 that are, that are created, but the lowest one of them all is uh, Sophia. They give a name to them, Sophia. Sophia, though, oh, and, and by the way, the eons are always wanting to understand more about the, their, their creator, the fullness. But Sophia, she becomes passionate and wickedly longs to be over the heavenly fullness. Okay? Like I said, this reads like mythology. Crazy stuff, right? Doesn't make, I mean, what in the world? Who created this doctrine? But this is what, this was, what was taught. So you, this is where you have a problem, right? Everybody's living in harmony until this eon called Sophia wants to be in charge over the fullness. Though she was eventually healed from her grievous action, she became divided. And her lower self, so her literally her person, whatever that would be, I mean again, you don't have you can just make this stuff up. So her 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 self got divided so she became divided. Her lower self was cast out of the realm of the fullness. And she became a shapeless being called Sophia Akamoth. And she became the mother goddess who brought forth the demiurge. We say, what in the world? You can't make this stuff up. Well, well, they kind of did. You say, what is this? The demiurge is the ignorant creator of the entire physical world that we live in right now. What you call God is what they would call the demiurge. The God of creation the ones that the Christians worshipped, the creator God, is what the Gnostics would say, that's just the demiurge. That's not the real fullness. The demiurge is Yahweh. The Jewish God of the Old Testament who foolishly thought he was the one true God. See how dangerous this gets? All that mythology comes to, comes to roost somewhere. It has, a, it has a place. There's a reason for all of that mythology. It's to deny the deity of the one true God. And only the enlightened Gnostics, the human beings who call themselves Gnostics, who are in the know. They are the ones who know that he's actually a corrupted being far inferior to even the goddess Sophia and even far more inferior to the fullness. So if you're worshiping this one true God you call Yahweh, you're living in la-la land You're being deceived. He's not the one true God. He was created. He's a created being. He thinks he's the one true God. He's been spewing lies ever since the beginning of time or for many, many years. All the Jews are, are out to lunch with this, they, the, the Gnostics would say. They're totally on the wrong boat here. We have the ascended knowledge. We have the truth. And they would present it that way. So what about humanity? How's, how's things practically work out? 
Well, there's three kinds of people, they would say, who live in this world. There are what's called the lost physical people of the world. They're just the pagan unbelievers who don't believe in anything. They just live in their life, trying to make money, do whatever they want. But then there's the soulless, the soulish people. Irenaeus, that's you. The Christians are the soulish people. You belong to the Orthodox churches. You, you say you believe in Christ and you, you affirm Jesus as the Son of God and that there's God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Sadly, you just don't have full gnosis or full knowledge. You don't have full understanding. And the only way you're going to truly receive salvation, what you call salvation, the only way that you can ascend to the higher levels is you got to do what we say. If you place your faith and trust in Christ, that's not going to help you. You've got to do what we say. You've got to earn it. You've got to work for it. And if you don't work for it, and working for it means you do our, what we list out for you. Do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. You'll never ascend to the higher knowledge. But there's a third group called the spiritual people. The spiritual people. We're, that's the highest human. Okay? That's the Gnostics themselves. <laughs> the one propagating all of this mythology. They are the only true, if you want to call it, Christians. They're the only true heavenly people. The people who are going to go and experience everything. And since, think of it this way, it's like you, everybody from here over, you're just the pagans, okay? I'm sorry, your life's over, there's no hope for you. Just eat, drink, be merry, enjoy life. Now everybody from here to here, oh man, you're the soulish. I'm hoping for you. I, I, you got to work and earn it, otherwise you're going to end up like these people. You don't want to end up like these people, do you? Now, I am the Gnostic. I have all the ascended knowledge. And I am untouched by it all. And the Gnostics would say, I don't have to perform any good works because I've already ascended. I'm already at that higher level. You are the plebes. I am the ascended one. And since I am the ascended one and I'm a Gnostic, I don't have to perform any good works because I have inborn into me higher spiritual nature. You do. Yes, I do. I'm the ascended one, you know. Therefore, I can engage in whatever activities I want in this world. I can go to the gladiator events, which was common in Roman society. I can seduce married women. I can live like the devil. These are off limits to you. You're just hopeless anyway. This is off limits to you, but I can do whatever I want. I can live any way I want, do anything I want, because I already have ascended knowledge. Do you see the danger of this? There is, I mean, this is what Irenaeus understands. This thing is dangerous. This is going to lead people into hell quicker than anything. This is going to put you on the fast track to eternal destruction. I mean, you're denying Jesus, the divinity of, the, of God's Son. You're denying the, uh, the deity of God Himself, God the Father. You've misinterpreted God the Holy Spirit. 
And you've created a system by which people can live in utter depravity and not feel any guilt over it. I mean, it's, this is dangerous at every level. That's why he writes five treatises, five book volume on this thing. That's why he dissects it even in more detail than I'm, I'm giving you the layman's summary version of this thing. I mean, he goes through all the details of it. It allows for a license to sin. And it's like the modern proverb. It's trying to have your cake and eat it too. They were given to secret wisdom by their savior, the eon. One of the eons. The demigod, one of the demigod eon, appeared on earth to humanity in the illusion of a human body to teach spiritual precepts that only the enlightened Gnostics would be able to comprehend. Through the purging action of his revealed knowledge, and sometimes also through illicit acts that depict the heavenly unions of angels, the Gnostics would eventually make their way up into the fullness as purified spirits. The ordinary Christians, which are you guys, right? You just, you just got to remain at a lesser station, even if you can work for it. So what it does, it creates a dichotomy here. Spiritual haves, spiritual have-nots. It, it creates that mindset. I have more of an ascended knowledge than you. And it made these people very proud, by the way. They felt enlightened. Like, I'm the ascended one, you know? It created, it created turmoil within the life of a church. It, 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 that kind of doctrine and heresy could destroy a church in a heartbeat. It was a promoted spiritual elitism. It promoted a lack of understanding of factual history of Jesus and his life and his ministry and his purpose. It took that and threw it under the bus. This was a dangerous teaching. It promoted a foreign use of biblical interpretation that created more confusion rather than clarity. You can just make it up as you go along. There's no rules here. There's no, no scriptural guide of how to interpret the Bible in the first place. It's, it's, it's whatever you want it to say. It's like, you know, that, you know what the meaning of Genesis 1-1 is? What's the purpose of Genesis 1-1? Did you know this? It's to teach us about baseball. You know that, right? You didn't heard this yet. See, I have more knowledge. Mm -hmm. Why do I know that? Because it says in the big inning. <laughs> it's all about baseball. It took 2,000 years to figure that out. Or 6,000 years to figure that out. That's, that, I mean, that's a crude example, but you know. You know the, the apostles? They drove vehicles. Did you know that? They drove cars. Say, wait a minute. There's no car. No, they drove cars. And I can tell you what kind of car they drove. I have ascended knowledge. <laughs> they drove Hondas. You don't know that? They drove Hondas because it said they were in one accord. Isn't that what the passage means? You see, they take the passages of the scriptures and totally obliterate any kind of true way of interpreting it and make it say something else. Okay, everybody else is leaving, so we got to ask me, that's my time to go. So think of Christian science, Scientology. Christian science is like grape nuts. It's not neither the grapes nor nuts, but it's grape nuts. Um, it's not Christian. It's not even scientific. It's uh, ideology. Uh, the rebuttal to this, we must follow the teachings of the apostles Peter, Paul, John, the New Testament, the Old Testament, who followed Jesus, our Lord. No dealing with speculations. We deal with fact. We deal with truth. Second, the Bible consists only of Old and New Testaments. Irenaeus actually coined the term New Testament. He was the one that started talking like that. 
There's no such thing as a Gnostic gospel. Even the idea of canonization, what books are to be in the Bible, that became an issue, mainly because of what these Gnostics were doing. That would happen over time. And finally, we must remind ourselves of the apostolic creeds that were used to summarize and distill the truth of the gospel message into salient points so that we understand how we should live. And that's why you don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as Hebrews would say, because you need the church. You need to be there to hear the truth. And the truth needs to be proclaimed. So you don't fall into these kinds of outlandish heresies. And next week we're going to talk about Tertullian. Does that make sense? Uh, any comments, questions? I'm trying to make this interesting as best I can. Yes. This smells remarkably like Mormon. Yeah, it's it's cultic. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot like it. Um, they have weird beliefs, and um, and it, it, there's a book called The Kingdom of the Cults. A guy named Walter Martin. He's passed away, but he wrote it, and I think it's been edited. But it goes through a lot of these cults. And uh, gives you a background where it came from and their their ideology and their theology. It's very helpful. But it, it this this kind of idea doesn't exist exactly today, uh, but there's elements of it that exist, and uh, and the cults and even with broader Christianity too, sadly. So you have to be aware of it. So I'm trying to keep this interesting, trying to make it real, and. Uh, don't want you to fall asleep. Every, that's the danger of church history. You know, I knew a church history professor who, when he was teaching, he put himself to sleep. <laughs> and the students were like, do we wake him up or do we just leave? <laughs> so it happened. So anyway, let's close in prayer and uh, we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, we thank you again for this time to be able to, um, to look at these matters. Lord, it's very much important that we follow your word, follow your truth. And, and not fall into any kind of heresy. Um, we need to make sure we're students of your word, and that's what we communicate to others, that's what we tell others, that's what we live by, uh, because that is your eternal word that will never fade away. This world's going to fade away, this world's going to pass away, but not your word and not you. You are same yesterday, today, and forever, and your truth is that way as well. Let us be always reminded of that. Give us a good rest of our day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we'll see you next week and we'll have week number four.